So guys, let's start with the cranial nerve nuclei and columns. Well, first, uh, let me tell you the approach that how we're going to go about this topic. Uh, in the cranial nerve nuclei, first, we need to understand the, the requirement for the columns. Like we have three efferent columns, but we have four afferent columns. So we got to look into a, a slightly a developmental part of that, that why there is a need for seven columns. What exactly is the meaning uh, for all the columns? We'll elaborate it and then we'll discuss them in more detail here. Once we're done with the cranial nerve nuclei column, we'll put them in a, in a tabular form. We'll see that which nuclei is present in which part of the brainstem. And then we'll take all the major nerves uh, discussing that what column belongs to those particular nerves. So uh, to begin with, pharyngeal arches. Now don't be surprised that I'm starting it with the pharyngeal arches, though our topic is cranial nerve nuclei. As I said, uh, first we need to understand that what is the need for having three efferent columns. Now, how many pharyngeal arches do we have? I'm sure you all know that pharyngeal arches we have, we have first pharyngeal arch, we got a second arch, third, fourth arch, fifth arch disappears, and then we have sixth pharyngeal arch. So there was a time when fifth arch was also there, but later on disappears. So we have five pharyngeal arches, one, two, three, four, and six. If broadly we talk about the nerve supply, first arch is supplied by the mandibular nerve. Now we'll be discussing all this in the embryology as well, but uh, we should know it as of now that first arch is supplied by mandibular nerve. Second arch is supplied by the facial nerve. Third arch is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve, whereas fourth and sixth arch, they both are collectively supplied by the vagus nerve. Yes, these are two different branches of vagus, but vagus only. Like we have a superior laryngeal nerve supplying the fourth arch and we got a recurrent laryngeal nerve for the sixth arch. Something to be discussed later on, but all I want you to focus on that what are the nerves for the respective pharyngeal arches. Well, once you've discussed the nerve, we should know that what muscles broadly are supplied by these nerves of pharyngeal arches. As we know that mandibular nerve supplies the muscles of mastication. Mandibular nerve supplies the muscles of mastication. So all the muscle of mastication will come under this first pharyngeal arch only. Although it is not only muscle of mastication, we have other muscles also by mandibular nerve. But broadly, I'm saying broadly ma muscle of mastication is by mandibular nerve. Facial nerve is taking care of the facial muscles. Glossopharyngeal and vagus nerve, collectively, they are supplying muscles of palate. They're supplying the muscles of palate. They do supply muscles of pharynx and also muscles of larynx. Glossopharyngeal and vagus nerve, right now we're just saying collectively, I say glossopharyngeal and vagus nerve, they supply muscle of palate, pharynx and larynx. Now, here's the point, guys. If you look at uh, all these pharyngeal arches, and you look at the muscle which are supplied by these. These are all skeletal muscle, first of all. Now, if we have a particular set of muscle derived from pharyngeal arches, so there has to be a separate column in the brainstem to supply only these muscles. So there is one column, let's not name it as of now. There is one column in the cranial, uh, in the brainstem, which is dedicated to supply the muscle derived from pharyngeal arches. So that is one group. Then there is a second group of muscle, which are again skeletal muscle present here in this region only but not derived from pharyngeal arch. Now think about it. What are the muscles left in this part? I want you to just think about this part here. So we're done with the muscle of mastication, facial muscles are done, palate, pharynx, larynx done. What is left? Extraocular muscle and tongue muscle. Now extraocular and tongue muscle are also what? They are skeletal muscle, but they are not derived from pharyngeal arches. So those muscles are called as a somatic muscles. They are derived from the somites or somatomere. So, guys, I would say that somatic muscles, somatic muscles in the head and neck part, we have so many somatic muscles below, biceps, triceps, they are all somatic muscles. We are only focusing on this part right now. So, the somatic muscle in the head and neck part, we got the extra ocular muscle and tongue muscle. Extra ocular and tongue muscle, they are somatic muscles. Sometimes you may get a question in which they might give you extraocular and tongue muscle both in the option, but you still have to choose a better one. So if you have to choose between extraocular and tongue muscle, your better answer would be the tongue muscle. The tongue muscles, you can say they are directly derived from somites. 
extra ocular muscles are actually derived from somatomeres so if the question says which muscles are derived from somites directly go with the tongue muscle but yes broadly i can say that somatic muscle in head and neck are extra ocular and tongue muscle now with that we understood one thing that in head and neck we have to have three types of column now why do we need three columns guys because one column we need to supply the muscles of pharyngeal arch then we need a column to supply the muscles derived from somite and what is the common thing between the two the common thing between the two is the both are the skeletal muscle so obviously we have some smooth muscles also here like sphincter pupillae ciliaris all those so for the smooth muscle and also for the glands there is a another column which is required here so the requirement for the efferent column the requirement for the motor columns we need three motor columns at least for the pharyngeal arch for the somatic muscles and then for the smooth muscles and the glands now before we go into further detail that how exactly these columns they develop and and uh, what are the name of the columns let me tell you another basic thing here that is about the development of the the two plate from the neural tube okay now let's presume this here is a picture of a neural tube and neural tube is divided in two parts neural tube is divided in two part by a sulcus by a primitive sulcus and that sulcus is called as the sulcus limitans that is called as a sulcus limitans look at the word guys limitans limit it limits the two part of neural tube so it is limiting the two part of neural tube we have one ventral part the one which i am highlighting this is the ventral part of the neural tube this is the ventral part of the neural tube and this ventral part of the neural tube is referred as the basal plate this ventral part of the neural tube is called as the basal plate whereas the dorsal part is referred as the alar plate dorsal part is referred as the alar plate so basal plate and alar plate this division of the neural tube is to be discussed in the embryology separately we just looking into the part which is required for the head and neck uh, uh, cranial nerve nuclear development so sulcus limitans divides the neural tube in the ventral basal part and dorsal alar part now i want you guys to for one second just forget about it's a neural tube just think in a way it is a spinal cord let's like, let's say it's a spinal cord section here if this is a spinal cord obviously this part of the spinal cord that is dorsal part of the spinal cord we all know is sensory part and the ventral part of the spinal cord is motor same story here alar plate dorsally present please remember this alar plate is a purely sensory plate it is a sensory plate whereas this basal plate which is present ventrally it is motor plate you can remember it from the from the spinal cord that spinal cord dorsal horn are sensory and ventral horn are motor so one thing is clear that if any cranial nerve nuclei if any cranial nerve column is developing in the alar plate it has to be a sensory nuclear or sensory column and all the motor cranial nerves or all the motor cranial nerve columns they will develop into the basal plate so one very simple and straight question that alar plate gives rise to the sensory nuclei and basal plate gives rise to the motor nuclei this also comes into the forms of form of mcqs they will give you four options and will ask you that which of the nuclei is developing from alar and which is from the basal plate so nothing to mug up here we just have to look at all the options we need to find out that which one is the sensory nucleus which one is a motor nucleus like let me throw some examples to you if i say hypoglossal nucleus now we know hypoglossal nucleus supplies the muscles of the tongue it's a motor nucleus so obviously it will develop from where the basal plate if i say uh, let's say that nucleus of tractus solitarius nucleus of tractus solitarius is for taste sensation so obviously it will develop from where from the alar plate and if i say let us say the trigeminal nuclei nuclei i'm saying plural trigeminal nuclei as we know trigeminal nerve is a mixed nerve so that means some part of the trigeminal nuclei will develop in the basal plate and some part will develop in the alar plate we'll see that subsequently so i hope you understood the the concept of alar and basal plate and how they are divided by the sulcus limitans and which one is sensory and which one is motor now the point is this neural tube is not going to stay like this now look at me guys let us say this here is a neural tube now this is a dorsal part which was a alar plate and here we have a basal plate here if i say neural tube is giving rise to spinal cord it makes sense neural tube is circular spinal cord is also circular and this space in between will give rise to the central canal of the spinal cord fine no problem but if i say the same neural tube 
is giving rise to the brain stem then this probably doesn't make much sense because brain stem is not exactly like this what we have inside brain stem there is no central canal in the brain stem we have fourth ventricle inside the brain stem so when that fourth ventricle develops what will happen this neural tube will open up and this will open up in such a way that this dorsal part that is the alar plate will move toward the lateral side so imagine fourth ventricle is developing inside and the alar plate is moving toward the lateral side which tells me that what nuclei are shifted toward the lateral side that the sensory one so the sensory nuclei the set of sensory nuclei goes toward the lateral side and as you can see basal plate is toward the medial side so majority of the motor nuclei are present close to the midline only this is something which you can apply uh, uh, from your uh, from the syndrome part in the brain stem as well when we read the syndromes in the brain stem you look at majority of the syndrome which are affecting the midline of the brain stem like millard gobler syndrome medial medullary syndrome weber syndrome which we will discuss eventually in the neuroanatomy majority of the syndrome which are affecting the midline of the brain stem the main loss is a motor loss the reason is simple the basal plate is close to the midline alar plate has gone toward the lateral side so obviously alar plate and any any syndrome which is affecting the lateral part of brain stem the major loss will be a sensory loss like in the wallenberg syndrome the main loss is a loss of pain and temperature from the body and from the face because it is toward the lateral side of brain stem so something which we can apply from this uh, development of neural tube right to the to the syndrome part so let us consider this neural tube in that open view and see what plate will come from where so there we go let's say guys this is a neural tube which has opened up so this here is the developing fourth ventricle in between that is the developing fourth ventricle inside and let's say this is the sulcus limitans i'm putting this dotted line here for the sulcus limitans which has moved more anterior laterally i'm just writing sl for the sulcus limitans so you can see the fourth ventricle is developing inside the neural tube has opened up let me put these arrows to tell you that what is the direction of the neural tube opening up so it is opening from the dorsal aspect and that's why the things are coming toward the lateral side the one which is now close to the midline here or you can say medial to the sulcus limitans what plate is that that is the the basal plate basal plate is now close to the midline and lr plate is more laterally placed make sure right on one side only so this here is the basal plate and there we got this lr plate the basal plate and the lr plate obviously as we said basal plate will have all the motor cranial nuclei now what is the difference between the nuclei and the column when we say the word nuclei and the column when you have the same type of nuclei arranged in one line we call it column like if you have all the nuclei which are supplying the muscles of pharyngeal arches so if you arrange them in one single line only that entire line is called as a one column so guys when you look at the basal plate we have three motor columns or can say three efferent column I hope you remember that why do we have three different columns because we have to supply three different type of muscles somatic muscle pharyngeal arch muscles and smooth muscle that's why three columns but when you go to the afferent column which is in the alar plate of course it's not three we have four sensory column and we'll understand that why there are four in number three motor four sensory what are these efferent columns let's name them and then we'll take them in detail by one by one the very first column here is called as g s e the second column here is called as s v e and the third column is referred as g v e g s e s v e and g v e so even before we write the name of the afferent column i want you guys to look into the detail of these columns one by one like gse when i write gse obviously gse stands for the general the s is for the somatic and needless to say they are all efferent column we are talking about first so they are all motor column efferent general somatic efferent now as soon as i say the word general somatic efferent what comes to your mind is guys somatic the word somatic should be highlighted here because we said which muscles are somatic muscles the somatic muscles were extraocular and tongue muscle that means this column is dedicated to supply only extraocular muscles and tongue muscles 
only extra ocular and tongue muscles will be supplied by this column that is a GSE column, general somatic game. Just catch the word somatic here. You have to find out that one keyword. You will not have enough time in the exam to look into the entire abbreviation and then think about the name of the column. You have to catch the keywords. The second column which we wrote guys, it is SVE. SVE. SVE stands for, it stands for the special, it stands special visceral efferent. Efferent, obviously all of them are efferent, so that's a special visceral efferent. The word we need to look at here is the special viscera. The special viscera, the specialized viscera. Although many authors say it's a misnomer, but uh, kind of you got to uh, kind of remember it. When you say special visceral efferent, the meaning of special viscera is branchial arches or pharyngeal arches. So the word special viscera here can be replaced with a branchial if needed. You know, branchial arches or pharyngeal arches. So special viscera is branchial. Special viscera is branchial. So either you call it special visceral efferent, and as I said, many book, many author call it branchial efferent also. Same thing. And the name suggests branchial efferent or special visceral efferent. This must be supplying the muscles. Muscles from where? Muscles from pharyngeal arches. This is supplying the muscles derived from the pharyngeal arches. Now, what is the common thing between the first two columns, guys? In the GSE and SV, the common thing that you notice here is whether it is extraocular muscle, tongue muscle, or muscles from the pharyngeal arches, which were muscles of mastication, facial expression. The common thing is that all these muscles are skeletal muscles. Therefore, the third and the last efferent column that we have is automatically for what? It is for the smooth muscles. So we have the column named as GVE. GVE stands for general visceral efferent. General visceral efferent. And this column is to supply what muscle? It is to supply the smooth muscles. And it also supplies glands. It's a very important column. It's an autonomic column. It supplies the smooth muscles and glands. Whatever gland you talk about, lacrimal, all these uh, parotid, submandibular, sublingual, all the glands of head and neck, even beyond. The smooth muscles in the gland are taken care of by the GVE column. So it's very, very important first to look into the name and then try to extract the, uh, the best in possible information out of it. When I say GSE, somatic, extraocular and tongue muscle, Special visceral efferent, special viscera, that is pharyngeal arches. And the third column which is left, you can go by the method of elimination. This obviously is for what? Smooth muscles and glands. Let me take you back to that neural tube. Now, let me take you back to that neural tube here. What about afferent column, guys? First of all, how to name the afferent column? Afferent columns are just the mirror image. Now, like we have a GAC, SV, GV. So when you start writing the name of the afferent column, it will go like this. Like we have a GVE here. So, correspondingly, we can write GVA. Like we have a SVE here. The next one we'll write here is SVA. Then we have GSE and this here is a GSA. But despite of that, there is one more column left and I'll come to that. I'm just putting a question mark here. We'll come back to it. GVA, SVA and GSA. GVA, SVA and GSA. Let's write the name. So first we wrote GVA and SVA. GVA that is general visceral afferent. Obviously this time all are afferent here. We're talking about the afferent or the sensory column. And we have special visceral afferent. General visceral afferent, special visceral afferent. Now, please listen to this very carefully, guys. First of all, whenever you're looking at the afferent and efferent column, never ever compare them. Don't compare them. If you compare the afferent and efferent column, you will always end up at the wrong answer. Because I said GVE means supplying the smooth muscles and gland. So GVA doesn't mean you're carrying the sensation from the smooth muscles and gland. No, no, not necessarily. So when you're looking at the efferent, afferent column, forget about the efferent column completely. Just don't even think about that even the, the efferent column exists. How to look at the afferent column is in two parts. The first word, the first word, like the first word here is what? General. And here the first word is what? Special. They are telling you about the type of sensation. 
type of sensation is it a general sensation like pain temperature touch pressure proprioception stretch or is it a special sensation like vision olfaction taste all that and the second word visceral is telling you that where the sensation is coming from so that's how you got to look at the afferent column the first word what type of sensation the second word where it is coming from type coming from type coming from so when i say general visceral afferent that means it is about the general type of sensation coming from the viscera and when i special visceral afferent the special type of sensation but again coming from where viscera let's take a one basic example if you having a cup of coffee the temperature of a coffee is a general sensation pain temperature all these are general sensation so temperature of the coffee felt on your tongue is a general sensation but the taste of the same coffee felt is a special sensation so general visceral afferent is all about carrying the general sensation general sensation from viscera now you also got to understand the word viscera here because when you if somebody say the word viscera in front of you the we think viscera means internal organ yeah viscera is usually the term we use it for the internal organ but here viscera is actually denoting to the endoderm if something is developing from the endoderm then we are using the word viscera for it if let's say it is derived from ectoderm or from mesoderm we are calling it body wall or somatic so viscera whenever i say the word viscera here in the afferent column especially think about it is it must be developing from the endoderm only and special visceral afferent means special sensation from the viscera and the point is the only special sensation from the viscera is taste the only special sensation from the viscera is taste and please mark my term i am not saying that taste is the only special sensation i am saying taste is the only special sensation coming from viscera we do have other special sensation but the thing are they are not coming from the visceral organ they are not coming from the visceral organ so that's why you got to keep that in mind so when we say the word taste taste is the only special sensation which is coming from the viscera actually the taste words are derived from the endoderm so i would say okay taste is a sensation which is coming from the viscera here vision olfaction hearing and balancing obviously they are all special sensation but none of these special sensation is coming from the structures which are endodermal in origin like if you look at the uh, the top part of the olfactory mucosa it is derived from the absorption of surface ectoderm so olfaction will not come into special visceral afferent if we talk about vision retina is derived from neuroectoderm we all know neuroectoderm ectoderm cannot be a viscera here and then i for internal ear hearing and balancing function of internal ear internal ear is derived from something called as otic capsule and optic capsule is also what otic capsule is also a ectodermal structure so these are special sensations but because they are coming from something which is not endodermal that's why we are not including them in this column here so when you say special visceral afferent you only have to think about taste and nothing else taste is the only thing where other sensation will go we'll come to that but before let's continue with the column what should be the next column guys the next column we wrote over there is g s a one of the very very important column loads of questions are asked on it the g s a stands for the general somatic afferent general somatic afferent now once again i wanted to look at the same way when you say general what type of sensation the general sensation stretch pain temperature proprioception but this time the difference is the sensation is coming from the somatic structure from the body wall structure something which is derived from either ectoderm or mesoderm like one the best example we can take here is a trigeminal nerve my trigeminal nerve of thalamic maxillary mandibular all these branches are carrying the general sensation from the face like pain temperature touch pressure proprioception all these will go through trigeminal nerve and ultimately these sensation when they travel through the trigeminal nerve they end in this column that is gsa column here so yes the sensation here is the general sensation it's the general sensation but the general sensation from where from the body wall i told you what is body wall see whatever is not viscera is body wall if it is not derived from endoderm you count it in the body wall part as of now we said three efferent and three afferent i hope you understood that now there is a one more column that we wrote over there which we left 
that, that what column is that guys what is that fourth afferent column we have now we have three afferent column and kind of with the corresponding name we have a afferent column the fourth column here the additional afferent column here is for those special sensation which are not coming from the endoderm or not coming from the viscera the special sensation which was coming from the viscera was taste so we said that was sva done olfaction hearing and balancing and vision these are also special sensation but because they are coming from a somatic structure so there has to be a separate column from them which is called as a special because sensation is special special somatic afferent special somatic afferent and that's why we have an additional column here which is called as s s a s s a special somatic afferent let me write it for you s s a this is for the special somatic afferent so what is the special somatic afferent as we said already the sensation are special and they are coming from the body wall now when you say special somatic afferent what all comes into it now th this is an important discussion here all affection will come into it all affection will come into it vision hearing and balancing hearing and balancing agreed olfaction vision hearing and balancing they all come under special somatic afferent you know the reason because uh, the 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 region where they are coming out from those regions are not derived from endoderm but the point is guys olfaction which is carried by the olfactory nerve the first nerve vision which is by the second cranial nerve optic nerve and hearing and balancing that is by the eighth cranial nerve that is vestibulo cochlear nerve what you have to think about here is that uh, we are discussing cranial nerve nuclei so do we have cranial nerve nuclei for all these nerves well no olfaction olfactory nerve fine there is a nerve but there is no cranial nerve nuclei there is no nuclei for it we do not have cranial nerve nuclei for olfactory nerve we all know that olfactory nerve starts in olfactory mucosa goes directly into the olfactory bulb game over vision optic nerve optic nerve will go it decussates and goes back into the the visual cortex again there is no nuclei for the optic nerve no cranial nerve nuclei for the optic nerve but for hearing and balancing that is for the eighth nerve yes we do have a nuclei for them and what are those we have vestibular nuclei we got vestibular nuclei and we also got cochlear nuclei we have vestibular and cochlear nuclei we'll see where are they present in the brain stem so in the brain stem there are nuclei called as vestibular and cochlear nuclei and this gives rise to an important uh, mcq here if the question says that olfactory nerve optic nerve and this uh, vestibular cochlear nerve nerve they come under under which column then you will say they will come under ssa column all the three nerves they come under ssa column all the three type of sensation they come under ssa column but if the question says which nuclei come under ssa column then obviously we do not have nuclei for these nerve the only nuclei we have is for the eighth nerve then your answer will be only eight the cranial nerve nuclei exist only for eighth nerve and not for the first and second so this here is about the the how we name these cranial nerve nuclei and columns and what is their meaning before we put them in the brain stem if we have a very quick recap on this guys the first we said is gse gse is general somatic efferent the word somatic is for the uh, uh, here for the body wall the muscles which are extraocular and tongue muscle coming from the somites then we said sve special visceral efferent special viscera as i said although it is a misnomer but you got to remember that it corresponds to the pharyngeal arches the brachial arches that's why it is also called as a brachial efferent and this is supplying all the muscle derived from the pharyngeal arches the third column gve that is the only efferent column left so this is the column dedicated to supply the smooth muscles and gland because the previous two columns are for skeletal muscle coming to the afferent column gva sva gva is carrying the general sensation from the viscera like if i take another example here having a lot of breakfast and i'm feeling my stomach is distended that feeling of distension of stomach which is coming through vagus nerve is a general type of sensation coming from the viscera so that will go into gva general sensation from the viscera sva special sensation from the viscera and we know that only thing which comes under this is taste gsa general somatic afferent sensations are general 
but coming from the somatic structure. So again, the same pain, temperature, touch, pressure, but they are not coming from the viscera. They are coming from the somatic structure like skin, like muscle, like periosteum, bone. So all the sensation will come under GSA column. It's a very, very important column from the exam point of view as well. And then we got SSA, special somatic afferent. All the remaining three sensation apart from taste, like vision and olfaction and hearing and balancing, they will come under SSA. The sensations are special, but they are derived from the body wall structure or somatic structures. One important thing here is guys, we cannot change the sequence of the column here. Like if you see the columns like GAC is the first or the medial most column and SA is the lateral most column. That is how you will see the spreading of the cranialum nuclei also. So when you're looking at the brain stem and you look at the vestibulocochlear nucleus, you expect to see the vestibulocochlear nucleus very much toward the lateral side. And when you look at any uh, like GAC nucleus, like for extraocular muscle, like oculomotor nucleus, your trochlear nucleus, you will see them very, very close to the midline of the brainstem. So that sequence can't be changed. Although developmentally, some nuclei will shift from the lateral to medial and medial to lateral side, not the entire column, some nuclei will shift from lateral to medial and medial to lateral. There's a different phenomena, which is called as a neurobiotaxis. We will discuss that in the neuroanatomy. So as of now, let's keep it simple only. So let's take all these seven columns put them in the brainstem and understand what nerve nuclei will come under these particular columns. So there we go. So let's read and draw these columns in there. So starting with the first column, from the very medial side, that was GSE. That was a very first column, the GSE. After GSE, it was SVE, special visceral efferent. And followed by that, we have GVE. Now, let's stop here only. Let's first talk about these three columns and then we'll add the rest of the columns. So make sure you leave some space on the side. And obviously, all these cranial nuclei are present in the brain stem. So they are present either in the midbrain in the pons or in medulla oblongata. Let's say these are the three part of brainstem. Midbrain, pons and medulla oblongata. To remind you again, GSE, the somatic, that means this column, this first column is purely for extraocular and tongue muscle. And we all know that all the extraocular muscles are supplied by third nerve, fourth nerve and the sixth nerve. And tongue muscles are supplied by the hypoglossal nerve, the twelfth nerve. That means the nuclei which you will see in the first column are 3, 4, 6 and 12. That's all. 3, 4, 6 and 12. Yes, what you have to remember is which nuclei is exactly where. Like third nucleus and fourth nucleus, they will be present in the midbrain. Sixth nucleus is in the pons. And this very long twelfth or hypoglossal nucleus will be present in the medulla oblongata. The location is important, guys. This is the third nucleus. That is fourth, that is trochlear, the sixth abducent here and the twelfth hypoglossal nuclei. So that is about the, that's all about first column. You already know that why we have these nuclei in the column because it is giving the column corresponds to the somatic muscle, which is extraocular and tongue muscle. So three, four, six and twelve. The second column, special visceral efferent, the word special viscera was the brinkel arches, the pharyngeal arches. Now, if you remember, what was the nerve for the first pharyngeal arch? First pharyngeal arch was supplied by the mandibular nerve. So we have a mandibular nucleus, or I should say motor nucleus of mandibular nerve present in the pons. What is the nerve for second pharyngeal arch? Second pharyngeal arch was supplied by facial nerve. Just below that, we have a facial nerve nucleus that is also in the pons. And then what was the nerve for the third arch, fourth arch, and sixth arch? Third, fourth, and sixth arch, they are all supplied by the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerve. So again, we have a huge nucleus in the medulla oblongata, which is a common nucleus for the ninth nerve, for the 10th nerve, and maybe to your surprise, 11th also. 9th, 10th and 11th. I'll tell you what 11th is that. Collectively, guys, this nucleus here is called as the nucleus ambiguous. This nucleus is called as a nucleus ambiguous. There's a different spellings for ambiguous. Some people write W. Nucleus ambiguous. So mandibular nucleus, facial nucleus, glossopharyngeal, vagus, which makes sense till here because all these in that sequence are the nerves of pharyngeal arches. 
Now, the only question is where this 11th is coming from. 11th. First question is, which 11th is it? Is it the spinal accessory or is it the cranial accessory? So guys, answer here is it is cranial accessory. See, we are, we are discussing cranial nerve nuclei. So it is a cranial accessory actually. And the reason cranial accessory nerve is included in this column, which is purely for pharyngeal arch, because even cranial accessory nerve supplies muscles of pharyngeal arches, but not directly. Now what happens is there is a foramen called as jugular foramen. We will be discussing this in a while. Jugular foramen. So you have a vagus nerve coming out of jugular foramen and we have a cranial accessory nerve also coming out of jugular foramen. Now the cranial accessory nerve, as soon as it comes out of jugular foramen, it joins with the vagus. So the further course of cranial accessory nerve is via vagus only. So it looks like that muscles of palate and pharynx, they are supplied by vagus nerve or by pharyngeal plexus, but originally their supply is coming from where? From the cranial accessory nerve. And that's why we have to give them due respect in this column. That is the reason the cranial accessory is included here. I want you guys to write it separately that uh, if the question is about the muscles of palate, muscles of palate and pharynx, muscles of palate and pharynx, and I'm saying palate and pharynx, not larynx. Let's keep the larynx out of it. Muscles of palate and pharynx, they are supplied by which nerve? They're supplied by the cranial accessory nerve. They're supplied by cranial accessory nerve, but you have to say via vagus. Cranial accessory via vagus. We'll understand how exactly it is done. There is something called as a hitch hiking. Head and neck is known for the hitch hiking when one nerve will join with other nerve and will reach its destination. That is called as hitch hiking. So cranial accessory nerve is joining the vagus nerve and then reaching its destination muscle. You can call it cranial accessory via vagus or you can even call it VAC. Guys, VAC stands for vago accessory complex. It's a complex of vagus nerve and accessory nerve. So we can call it vago accessory complex, VAC, vago accessory complex. Right? That's why we have the cranial accessory nerve in that column in the nucleus ambiguous. Actually, if I put a question for you here, let us say there is an injury to nucleus ambiguous. So what will happen? If there is injury to nucleus ambiguous, and nucleus ambiguous is gone, means which nerves are compromised? Our ninth nerve is gone, our 10th nerve, and even 11th, cranial accessory is gone. That means the muscles of palate, pharynx, and even larynx, because vagus is also there. Muscles of palate, pharynx, and larynx are compromised on, on the same side, or to which side the injury we are talking about. And that will lead to the paralysis of all the muscles of palate, pharynx, and larynx because of nucleus ambiguous involvement. And we call it bulbar paralysis. This is called as a bulbar paralysis. So, if there is an injury to nucleus ambiguous, you can add that point also. Injury to NA, that is nucleus ambiguous. Injury to nucleus ambiguous will lead to ipsilateral, ipsilateral bulbar paralysis. Palate, pharynx, larynx, muscle of one side are involved. So we call it bulbar paralysis. Although it's not a complete bulbar paralysis because for the bulbar paralysis to take place, even tongue muscle should be involved. But tongue nuclei is, let's say it is saved. Hypoglossal nucleus is, is still safe. We are just talking about the injury to nucleus ambiguous. So we call it bulbar paralysis. But yeah, tongue muscles are spared in it. And what else? What else? Uh, what other important feature you will see here? Ninth and 10th nerve being a major contributor to this uh, to this nuclei and we all know that 9th and 10th nerve are responsible for a reflex that is a gag reflex so there also will be a loss of gag reflex there also will be a loss of gag reflex so injury to nucleus ambiguous will lead to ipsilateral bulbar paralysis and there will be a loss of gag reflex as well Coming back to the table here, so we're done with the first two column that is and we already said that the common thing between the first two column is they are specifically for skeletal muscle. There comes the third column, the GVE, the column which is dedicated to the smooth muscles and glands. Now, let me tell you what nuclei are there. The first nuclei that you see here, which is at the level of third nucleus only, look at that, it is present at the level of third nucleus in the midbrain. And this nucleus is the edinger westphal I'm writing EW, that is the edinger westphal nucleus. In the pons, we have two nuclei there. One is called as superior salivatory nucleus and then we have inferior salivatory nucleus. The superior salivatory and the inferior salivatory. And once again, we have a big nucleus present in the medulla oblongata, which is referred as the 
dorsal nucleus of vagus we call it the dorsal nucleus of vagus edinger westphal superior salivary inferior salivary nucleus dorsal nucleus of vagus edinger westphal is present in the midbrain exactly at the level of third nucleus it is exactly at the level of third nucleus pons is having a superior and the inferior salivary and middle oblongata again a big nucleus in the middle oblongata called as a dorsal nucleus of vagus well the reason we call it dorsal nucleus of vagus because it is shifted dorsal in the brain stem when you open the brain stem and you look at a section of a brain stem you will find this nuclei in very much posterior part of the middle oblongata so we call it dorsal nucleus of vagus now this is a very very important column and we have to discuss it in more detail separately so we'll complete this table uh, in a while let's take this gve column and talk in more detail about it and let's fetch answer to few more questions guys gve edinger westphal now we know that what is the function of edinger westphal edinger westphal is the nucleus which is going to supply the sphincter pupillae and ciliaris muscle right so the nerve which will come out of the edinger westphal this nerve ultimately will go and supply the sphincter pupillae it will supply the sphincter pupillae and ciliaris muscle dilator pupillae is supplied by sympathetic nerve we are just talking about the cranial nerve cranial nerve are obviously parasympathetic so edinger westphal nucleus the nerve comes out from there and that supplies sphincter pupillae and ciliaris now the question is which nerve what nerve is going to supply the sphincter pupillae and ciliaris edinger westphal fibers they join with the third nerve only oculomotor nerve so fibers of from the edinger westphal they go along with the third nerve and then they reach their destination muscle which we will look into then when we'll talk about the third nerve separately the next in the line was superior salivary nucleus and let me write the other one also that was a inferior salivary nucleus superior salivary inferior salivary the name and their function is kind of opposite here the one which is called as a superior salivary nucleus is supplying the salivary gland which are below and the one which is called as inferior salivary nucleus is supplying the salivary gland which is above so it's like kind of reverse here so when you think of parotid gland parotid gland is by the inferior salivary nucleus whereas submandibular and sublingual gland is by superior salivary nucleus now let me write the name of these glands first like superior salivary nucleus we said it is for the submandibular sublingual and inferior salivary i'm writing it for the parotid gland that is for the parotid gland but does it mean that these salivary nucleus are only taking care of the salivary gland when it comes to cranial nerve nuclei or the name of the column you should never you should never trust the name of the nuclei because sometimes the name of the nuclei is corresponding to a particular thing but that is not the only function done by the nuclei like the name here is a superior salivary nucleus which makes sense okay it is supplying the salivary gland submandibular sublingual but that is not the only function it is also supplying another major gland here and that is the lacrimal gland lacrimal gland lacrimatory fiber they originate from the superior salivary nucleus or they can say that lacrimatory nucleus is a part of the superior salivary only in simple word guys in simpler term parotid gland is the only gland supplied by inferior salivary nucleus and you think of any other gland here they are all taken care of by superior salivary submandibular sublingual lacrimal nasal i mean pharyngeal all these glands are taken care of by the superior salivary itself so except parotid everything else comes into superior salivary and finally we wrote the dorsal nucleus of vagus then there was this dorsal nucleus of vagus i'm writing in short dorsal nucleus of vagus which is taking care of the smooth muscles and glands which is taking care of smooth muscles and glands in thorax and abdomen mainly in thorax and abdomen mainly see vagus is the only nerve going beyond head and neck it is the only cranial nerve which is going beyond head and neck so obviously if you have to supply the smooth muscle of esophagus or stomach or duodenum then obviously vagus nerve will take care of it so it take care of the smooth muscle there it take care of all the the gastric glands and everything that is by the vagus nerve 
in the nucleus is dorsal nucleus of vagus well no confusion here when you say dorsal nucleus of vagus so obviously the nerve here is vagus nerve only vagus nerve is carrying the fiber but for the superior and the inferior salivary you have to remember superior salivary nucleus supplying all these gland is via which nerve it goes via facial nerve so if the question is asked that what is a nerve for the superior salivary nucleus it's a facial nerve whereas inferior salivary nucleus supplying parotid gland is via glossopharyngeal nerve or ninth nerve it is via glossopharyngeal nerve or ninth nerve now wait, look at this pattern here four cranial nerve nuclei we just saw in the gve column four nerves you are looking at here and supplying different smooth muscles and glands which tells me that this third nerve seventh nerve ninth nerve and tenth nerve these are the four cranial nerve out of 12 cranial nerve four of them are supplying smooth muscles and gland rest eight of the nerves rest eight nerves which are left they are not taking care of any smooth muscle or gland so it is only the function of these four nerves and that's why and that's why these four cranial nerves are also called as the parasympathetic cranial nerve all these four cranial nerves are referred as parasympathetic cranial nerve they are the parasympathetic cranial nerve 3 7 9 10 so in the head and neck part when you talk about the parasympathetic contribution it come from third nerve seventh nerve ninth and tenth nerve now we got some questions which were asked in the previous exam with, with the with, uh, with the same only just modifying the same information like the question has been asked that which uh, nerves come under parasympathetic column so 3 7 9 10 simple straight answer they've even asked this question once that which column is referred as parasympathetic column so obviously what column are we talking about we are calling talking about the gve column so guys you can note that gve column is also referred as the parasympathetic column it is also referred as the parasympathetic column because all the nuclei present here they, they do have some parasympathetic function after a couple of years they they modified this question a bit instead of asking that which nerves are parasympathetic the question was that parasympathetic outflow is constituted by what nerves parasympathetic outflow is constituted by what nerve so let's have a, a little discussion on this so when i say the word sympathetic and parasympathetic let's take the parasympathetic first parasympathetic outflow i hope you all know that the word parasympathetic outflow goes for the craniosacral outflow when you say craniosacral outflow that means parasympathetic outflow so parasympathetic outflow is also called as the cranio sacral outflow and guys in the cranio sacral outflow i can already see the two things there the one is cranio and one is sacral now cranio is obviously corresponding to cranial nerve and what cranial nerves we just said 3 7 9 10 and sacral which sacral nerve s2 s3 and s4 s2 s3 and s4 so if the question is asked that parasympathetic outflow is constituted by what nerves your answer is 3 7 9 10 s2 s3 s4 that is craniosacral outflow some cranial nerves like four cranial nerves and three sacral nerves together they form the parasympathetic outflow system and because they've already asked a question on the parasympathetic outflow so no wonder they can ask it on the sympathetic outflow also Now, sympathetic outflow is called as what? It is called as the thoracolumbar. Although we'll discuss in the in the neuroanatomy, but because I'm talking about the parasympathetic, so why not talk about the sympathetic as well? Sympathetic outflow is called as a thoracolumbar outflow. Thoracolumbar outflow. Again, look at the word, guys. Thoraco and lumbar. That means some thoracic nerve and some lumbar nerves are forming thoracolumbar outflow. Thoraco. Well, all thoracic nerve and the first two lumbar nerve. So when it comes to thoracolumbar outflow, it is starting from T1 till l2 t1 to l2 nerve coming out of the spinal cord they constitute the sympathetic outflow or thoracolumbar outflow so this is about uh, a bit about this column the gve column very important column they might ask you the name of the nuclei the location of the nuclei what nerve are related to this which gland are supplying it and about their parasympathetic function again let's fall back to our table so guys we are done with the efferent column now the first three column done 
skeletal muscle from pharyngeal uh, skeletal muscle from somites are done skeletal muscle from pharyngeal arch are done and smooth muscles and glands are also over now coming to afferent column now if i name the afferent column in that sequence the next column should be gva and the next one should be sva but here is a catch guys you have to keep gva and sva together so when you're writing the afferent column just write GVA and SVA together. Write GVA and SVA together. I'll tell you why. GVA and SVA together. Followed by what is the next column? The next column was GSA. And the last and the very special column that was SSA. Special Somatic Afferent. So the thing which is uh, uh, which might be bothering few of you that why are we writing GVA and SVA together guys? The, First, look at the what exact information it is imparting. When I say GVA and SVA together, that means there has to be some common nucleus which is acting as GVA as well as SVA. That means there must be a nucleus which is carrying the general sensation from the viscera as well as the taste sensation from viscera. And the speciality, speciality of that nucleus is that nucleus is present in the medulla oblongata. It's a big nucleus present in the medulla oblongata which is functioning as GVA as well as SVA and the, and the unique property is that this is the only nucleus present in this entire column. Nothing above, nothing below. There is no piece of gray matter that you see above this. There is no piece of gray matter you see below it. So it is alone and we know alone is called as what? Solitary. And that's why this nucleus is called as nucleus of tractus solitarius. This is called as a nucleus of tractus solitarius. This is called as a nucleus of tractus solitarius. Solitary nucleus, the only nucleus in the column. That's why such name is given to it. But yes, because it is having two functions, GVA and SVA, point to be noted here is that the cranial part of this nucleus is SVA. Taste will go to the cranial part and the general sensation will go to the caudal part. The general sensation will go to the larger caudal part and the taste sensation will go to the cranial part. If, if I take an example here, like glossopharyngeal nerve, is supplying the posterior one third of tongue and glossopharyngeal nerve is taking the general sensation as well as taste sensation from there so glossopharyngeal nerve from posterior one third of tongue will take general as well as taste sensation so whether it is taste fiber of glossopharyngeal nerve or general sensation of general uh, sensation fiber of glossopharyngeal nerve they both will come into the same nucleus the only difference will be the taste fiber will terminate into the cranial part and the general sensation fiber will terminate into the caudal part of the same nucleus present in that column. So it's a collective, nu uh, it's a uh, single nucleus which is there in the two collective column here. And that's why it is so important because imagine if there is injury to nucleus of tractus solitarius, then we are going to lose all the visceral sensation at once. Everything. Because there's one nucleus and that is the only nucleus we have for the two important columns. Moving on to next that case, that is GSA, General Somatic Afferent. General Somatic Afferent. Now, General Somatic Afferent is having a huge nuclei and I'm saying using the word nuclei because it's a combination of nucleus. A part of that nuclei is present in the midbrain. A major chunk is present here. The, the bigger, th thicker part is present in the pons and we have very, very long part which is extending into the medulla oblongata and even going beyond medulla oblongata. So we have this big nuclei present here and you can basically divide this nucleus in three parts in the midbrain, then the thicker and more rounded part that you will see that is in the pons and then we have this part which is starting in the pons only. If you are drawing it just make sure it starts in the pons, it goes into the medulla and it extends into the spinal cord also. Collectively this nucleus is called as a trigeminal nuclei. This is called as a trigeminal nuclei. We have to discuss more detail of this trigeminal nuclei. Let's do it in a, in a minute. Let's just draw it and leave it for now. Let me come to the last column and then we'll come back to this GSA here. What is the last column guys? SSA, Special Somatic Afferent. We already said the nuclei which will come under SSA are which one? We have a vestibular and the cochlear nuclei. So we got a vestibular and the cochlear nuclei. So vestibular nuclei and the cochlear nuclei. I'm just writing V and C here. The V is representing vestibular 
and C is representing cochlear. Where where they are located? Somewhere at ponto medullary junction. Just remember this: the location of the vestibular nu cochlear nuclei is at ponto medullary junction. All these information will be very much needed in the neuronat, in the brainstem part, when we'll talk about the auditory pathway. So we'll need to find out that where the cochlear nuclei is present, and they are nuclei, guys. We don't we don't have one vestibular nuclei or one cochlear nuclei. We have multiple vestibular and cochlear nuclei, and all of them are situated somewhere close to the ponto medullary junction. And finally, again falling back to the GSA column. So let's let's. take this column separately and then talk about all possible questions from there so i want you also to write about it separately guys the gsa general somatic afferent and as we already saw the three parts of it there we go now guys this portion the cranial part of the trigeminal nuclei well obviously collectively this is called as a trigeminal nuclei having three different part and we have to name them name these parts separately for the different function the cranial part of this nucleus the one which i highlighted with yellow here this is present in what part of brain stem it is present in the midbrain and we all know that midbrain the technical term for the midbrain is mesencephalon so that's why it is also called as the mesencephalic nucleus this is called as the mesencephalic nucleus either you call it mesencephalic or mesencephalic the same thing mesencephalic nucleus the second part here this one which is present in the pons is called as the principal sensory nucleus this is principal sensory or you can even call it the chief sensory principal sensory or chief sensory nucleus and the third nuclei the third part here well this as i said it starts in the pons major part is in the medulla oblongata but because it goes to the spinal cord in fact to tell you it was a question even asked it extends till the c2 level of the spinal cord it goes till the second cervical segment it goes till the c2 level of the spinal cord and for that reason this nucleus is called as a spinal nucleus this is called as a spinal nucleus because it extends to the spinal cord so we call it a spinal nucleus mesencephalic nucleus the word mesencephalic came from mesencephalon that is midbrain principal sensory nucleus the thickest part maximum fibers will go into that it's a very thick part of the nucleus present in the pons and the one which is in the pons in medulla and also in the upper part of spinal cord is spinal nucleus why do we have the three different nuclei because they are all carrying different information now before i write them i wanted to understand this when you compare the head and neck to rest of the body in the rest of the body i i hope you all know there are different type of tracts which are present there we have a dorsal column tract we have a spinothalamic tract we have a spinocerebellar tract so we have a different tract for different function like we have a different tract for proprioception we have a separate tract for pain and temperature we have a separate set of tract for the touch and pressure and so in head and neck we don't have dorsal column tract we don't have all these uh, what do you say spinothalamic tract that means everything in this part especially in this face region it is done by the trigeminal nerve only so my trigeminal nerve is having the responsibility of carrying everything be it pain temperature touch pressure proprioception so when let's take let me take one example very specifically like if ophthalmic nerve is carrying the pain temperature and all the sensation from the forehead region it goes inside the brain stem and by the time it reach a nuclei in the brain stem there should be a separate nucleus for separate information so the ophthalmic nerve goes inside and by the time ophthalmic nerve let's say reaches here then the sensation they separates the proprioceptive information will go into above uh, the upper part the pain and temperature will go into the lower part and that is why we have three different nuclei here so mesencephalic nucleus is the one which will carry all the proprioceptive information so it is for the proprioception mesencephalic nucleus is for the proprioception principal sensory nucleus is for touch and pressure this is to carry the touch and pressure and the spinal nucleus is the one which is carrying pain and temperature predominantly proprioception touch and pressure and pain and temperature well, these are the general sensation we talk about and they're all going into the trigeminal nuclei but you have to remember 
which part of the trigeminal nuclei proprioception above then touch and pressure and then pain and temperature now using this uh, basic information about this gsa column there are loads of questions asked in the previous year exam and especially the central institute the inict they are very uh, fond of asking questions from the mesencephalic nucleus now one we already said guys mesencephalic nucleus is for proprioception now see what other kind of questions can be derived from here now once they ask this question that what nucleus in the brain stem is the center for the jaw reflex what is the nucleus for the jaw reflex here now jaw reflex when you talk about the jaw reflex it's a deep tendon reflex just just like your patellar reflex so when you when you tap a patellar tendon then obviously you send inside the stretch and the proprioception and for that stretch and proprioception you get the reflex in the knee same story here for the jaw reflex you tap in here the mandibular nerve is the one which will carry the proprioceptive information and proprioceptive information will go into which nucleus mesencephalic nucleus and that's why please note that mesencephalic nucleus is the nucleus for jaw or you can say mesenteric reflex same thing jaw reflex or mesenteric reflex it's a nucleus for jaw reflex or mesenteric reflex then next year they again ask the same kind of question but this time they again kind of change the information here this dramatic change in the language of questions makes us feel that the questions are asked differently every time but that is not the case uh, it's the same information which is being used in a different way you know it is a nucleus for proprioception from there you can derive that this is going to be the nucleus for a deep tendon reflex that is jaw reflex and then what question was asked the question was that what is the site in the central nervous system where you find pseudo unipolar neurons guys what is the site in the central nervous system where you find pseudo unipolar neuron now i want you to first understand the need for pseudo unipolar neuron and then we'll mark the answer here now if we talk about jaw reflex let you can just write it separately anyway if this here let us say is the mandible and you're just doing this jaw reflex test on it now once you tap here the sensation through the mandibular nerve will go like this that is a mandibular nerve so that's a proprioceptive information let us say the proprioceptive information is going through the mandibular nerve this is the mandibular nerve the sensory branch of mandibular nerve and goes into what nucleus it goes into the the mesencephalic nucleus let me just draw it that is a mesencephalic nucleus you already know that right the point is this mandibular nerve is not going to relay there this mandibular nerve is not going to relay there because if mandibular nerve will relay there so first relay will take place here and the second relay will take place in the motor nucleus we don't have enough time in the reflex that you relay once you relay twice and then the motor output will come this information will go in the mesencephalic nucleus and we have a pseudo unipolar neuron present over there which will allow the fiber to came out from the other side and direct these fibers to the motor nucleus of mandibular nerve this here is the motor nucleus of mandibular nerve it goes to the motor nucleus of mandibular nerve and obviously the mandibular nerve will come out and we all know it supplies what muscle as the question goes it supplies the mesenteric muscle here that's the reflex pathway you're looking at that's the reflex pathway you're looking at so sensation goes through mandibular nerve into mesencephalic nucleus do not relay there we have a pseudo unipolar neuron thankfully which will guide the information toward the motor nucleus of mandibular nerve where they will relay and now the efferent will come out and supply the mesenteric muscle that means in this total reflex pathway the synapse took place only once here only there was no synapses here the only synapse took place is here and that is a general principle for all the deep tendon reflex whether it is ankle reflex or knee reflex or biceps reflex or jaw reflex that all the deep tendon reflexes are monosynaptic reflexes deep tendon reflexes <clears throat> deep tendon reflexes dtr deep tendon reflexes are by law monosynaptic reflexes they are all monosynaptic reflexes which makes sense guys if imagine if we have a, a relay in the nucleus then next fiber will start there and come here and then again will start here and come here so it will be a bisynaptic or trisynaptic reflex and the speed of the reflex will be compromised we want to have a reflex we want it very fast sensation should go in and quickly the reflex should come out and that is only possible by having a least number of synapses so only one synapse 
and that is taking place in the motor nucleus. So we have a monosynaptic. All the deep tendon reflexes are monosynaptic reflexes. They synapse only once. Which gave us the answer to the question when we said that pseudo unipolar neurons are present where in the brainstem? The answer is again mesencephalic nucleus. So this mesencephalic nucleus, please note that, is the is the only site is the only site in CNS is the only site in CNS for pseudo unipolar neurons for pseudo unipolar guys you call it pseudo unipolar or even unipolar the same thing only functionally when it when you talk about they are actually pseudo unipolar only so even if in some books it is written as unipolar don't confuse that's the same thing unipolar or pseudo unipolar actually means the same here so only site in cns for pseudo unipolar neurons so see how the informations are derived from one thing that mesencephalic nucleus is for proprioception from there we could identify okay if it is a site for proprioception then this has to do something with the the jaw reflex because obviously the the proprioception comes into it and because it is a site for the jaw reflex so it has to be the site of what neuron the pseudo unipolar neuron and the important point again uh, let me remind you here is cns in central nervous system because in peripheral nervous system we have loads and loads of example for pseudo unipolar neuron dorsal root ganglia geniculate ganglion at so many places we have pseudo unipolar neuron but in the central nervous system nowhere else we have pseudo unipolar except for mesencephalic nucleus and finally which is very recently just a couple of years back there was another question asked from the same nuclei but this time they shifted their focus from mesencephalic nucleus to the spinal nucleus now see the question was that which of the following information or which of the following sensation is not carried to the spinal nucleus now when somebody say which of the following information or sensation is not carried to the spinal nucleus the two option are easily eliminated pain and temperature pain and temperature are definitely coming into it so that cannot be the answer we have to find out which is not coming into it now the other option they gave was touch and proprioception now if you remember i told you that the nucleus the spinal nucleus is present in the pons also it starts in the pons that means it is adherent to what principal sensory nucleus so it is very much possible that the cranial part of spinal nucleus might be having some properties of principal nucleus as well that's why it is to be noted that the cranial part of the spinal nucleus the cranial part of the spinal nucleus is also having some fibers for touch and pressure just the cranial part the cranial part of spinal nucleus also carries touch and pressure so i can attribute the spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve for pain temperature predominantly of course but the cranial part is also carrying the touch and pressure but yes one information which is definitely not going into the into this is proprioception so answer to that question will be the proprioception has nothing to do with the spinal nucleus so this is about the the cranial nerve nuclei and the columns if i again take you back here a very very quick recap on the columns here it's it's always better to kind of learn everything uh, during the lecture itself so guys gac the first column Again, so the first column is for what? That is dedicated only for extraocular and tongue muscle. That's why the nerve that you're looking at over there are supplying either extraocular muscles or tongue muscles. SVE, the column pharyngeal arches. Look at the nerve supplying the pharyngeal arches. Mandibular nerve for the first arch, facial for the second arch, glossopharyngeal third arch, fourth and sixth arch are by vagus nerve, and cranial accessories also supplying the muscles of pharyngeal arch, but via vagus. So nucleus ambiguus is there. GVE, parasympathetic column. Edinger Westphal superior inferior salivary dorsal nucleus of vagus the nucleus of third nerve seventh nerve ninth nerve and tenth nerve the parasympathetic nuclei are there in the GVE column GVA SVA general visceral afferent special visceral afferent only one nucleus doing both the function so all the visceral information whether it is a general type of sensation or a taste sensation goes into the nucleus of tractus solitarius GSA probably the most important three part mesencephalic principal sensory and spinal for proprioception for touch and pressure for pain and temperature and and uh, remember one thing guys although we named this nucleus as trigeminal nuclei but that doesn't mean only trigeminal nerve or fiber can come inside any nerve any nerve which is carrying pain temperature touch pressure 
from the somatic structure or from the body wall or you can say from the skin let's say one example will come into this so if facial nerve is carrying any general sensation from the body wall that can come into this nuclei don't think the name is trigeminal nuclei so only trigeminal nerve will come inside no 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 think about what is the function the function is gsa so don't bother about the name and the last column ssa special somatic afferent which is only having this vestibular cochlear nuclei present at ponto medullary junction once we're done with these uh, uh what do you say the columns here now when we'll talk about the cranial nerves in the next part we'll take every single cranial nerve and we also have to look at which column they belong to and then we'll discuss it because i want you to anticipate the nuclei for that particular nerve and then after that we'll look into the nerve and then we'll find out that what nerve has having how many nuclei which will also define the type of function a particular nerve will 